Welcome, Bereans. My name is Christina Gamble. I'm the director of the Black Cultural Center here at Berea College. And I'm excited today to moderate our convocation entitled Sankofa, Learning from Our Past to Build for Our Future. Today, I'm excited to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Takia Anthony. She is an associate professor of history and an academic support liaison at the Kentucky State University. Her areas of expertise are mobilized African diaspora and archiving. She has lectured and spoken on panels throughout the United States, South Korea, the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Colombia, London, and Ghana. Dr. Anthony is a native of Bowling Green, Kentucky, where she is the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in history. She serves on the board of directors of the African-American Museum in Bowling Green area and was the 2015 recipient of the Women of Achievement Native Daughter Award given by the Bowling Green Human Rights Commission. She is an alumna of Howard University in Washington, DC and North Carolina Central University where she was inducted into the 2016 class of 40 under 40. Dr. Anthony emanates both schools motto of truth and service as the founder of Dr. Takia's empowerment by hosting HBCU tours for the youth in her hometown. Prior to joining Kentucky State University, Dr. Anthony was an assistant professor of history at NCCU where she won the 2020 College of Arts and Sciences Excellence in Teaching Award and the 2019 College of Arts and Sciences Excellence in Research Award. She also served as an assistant professor of history and director of public history at Edward Waters College in Jacksonville, Florida. There, Dr. Anthony was the 2017 Teacher of the Year and inducted the 2016 class of Jacksonville Black Pages 20 under 40. Welcome Dr. Takia Anthony. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction and thank you for having me this evening. It is truly an honor to be here during Black History Month. And as a Kentuckian and an active member of the Association for the Study of African American Life in History, or as we say in short, ASALA, it is apropos that I share space and time with Berea College, the alma mater of Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the father of Black history. In the spirit of evoking Dr. Woodson and other change agents who transition, I would like for you all to participate with me in pouring libations. This is an African practice that commemorates the ancestors. As I pour this water into this vase, I will speak the names of ancestors and at the end we will say ashe, which loosely means so be it. All right, I will begin. I... I will begin with Dr. Carter G. Woodson, Harriet Tubman, John Brown, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, Amy Jakes Garvey, Amy Ashwood Garvey, Booker T. Washington, Ida B. Wells Barnett, W.E.B. Dubois, Claudia Jones, James Wilden Johnson, Aretha Franklin, Henry Bibb, Sylvia Jacobs, Walter Rodney, Rosalind Turbord Penn. To all the ancestors known and unknown, who fought however you saw fit to resist oppressions and forge a better future, which is now our present. 
I ask for your permission to allow us in your space to recognize your intellect. I ask you provide knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and clarity to all who seek the truth. I ask for courage as we continue to fight for justice and freedom. And I thank you for your courage and all the strides you made. We commemorate you as we say together, Ashe, Ashe, and Ashe. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see. Click on the PowerPoint and then you can move it with your keyboard. Click on the PowerPoint and then. Just click some on, yeah, you can do that as well. Okay, thank you. All right, let's start with Sankofa. Sankofa is an Akan word that literally translate as, it is not taboo to go back and fetch what you forgot. We interpret the Sankofa bird, which is facing forward while looking back with an egg in its mouth to also mean looking or learning forward from the past while forging a future. This evening, we will discuss various leaders and explore three vital forms of resistance from the past to help us build for the future. And you all have participated in our first point with libations. Memory is a form of resistance. The concept of Sankofa is a form of resistance. Oppressive systems benefit from oppressed people not having a memory. A lack of memory is a lack of knowledge. The ability to keep the memories alive are important and also serve as a form of resistance. What if Aladu Equiano had no memory of being captured in Africa, the slave trade, and slavery in the Caribbean? Would we know the terrors of the slave trade or early slavery? Or if Solomon Northrop had no memory of his 12 years as a slave in the Deep South, would we understand the horrors of slavery? Or if while enslaved, he had no memory of freedom, would he have kept the faith to be a free man again? Imagine if we had no memory of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Would Black History Month be celebrated? Or what if Dr. Woodson had no historical memory of slavery or Africa prior to the slave trade? Would he have been an advocate for Black history? Would he have several books exploring the contributions of Africans and African-Americans to world history? What if we had no history or no memory of James Weldon Johnson? Would Beyonce be able to have a rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing to share with the world at Coachella? Or what if Johnson had no historical memory of the African and African-American past to pin the words of Lift Every Voice and Sing? We have come over a way that with tears has been watered we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out of the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. May we forever stand true to our God and true to our native land. If we had no memory of Rosa Parks, would we understand that she refused to move out of her seat on the bus because she was fed up with the numerous reports of rapes and lynchings of black women and men? And when she learned about Emmett Till's heinous murder, she acted. 
Would we really know about the catalyst of the modern civil rights movement? Or what if Rosa Parks had no historical memory of the destruction of black bodies? We like to discuss Ms. Parks as a tired seamstress. However, she was also a field secretary for the NAACP. She received letters and calls daily about rapes and lynchings and 14 year old Emmett Till moved her. We thank Mamie Till for her bravery to evoke memory when she allowed the world to view her unrecognizable son at his home going. These photos, like those of lynched and dismembered black men and women, illustrate a historical memory of terror. Preserving this historical memory is a form of resistance because it allows us to situate the current terrorization of black men and women into context. These acts are not new and this moment in time is not new. Ida B. Wells Barnett used her journalistic skills to combat lynching prior to Ms. Parks. And currently we see the activism of Tamika Mowry who continues to fight for the justice of slain black bodies. Historical memory shows that civil rights movements follow these acts of terror. Memory is resistance. My charge to you is to exercise memory. Oftentimes we misinterpret history by viewing it from the top down instead of the bottom up. History is made on the local level and community histories are vital. I implore you to become Alex Haley, the author of Roots, who has ties to Berea College. Talk to the oldest person in your family or in your community. Talk to the oldest person and ask them about their life, their parents, grandparents, and great grandparents. Collect and preserve the memories. Some of us have James Wilden Johnson's, Rosa Parks, and Ida B. Wells Barnett's in our very own families and communities. The difference is our loved ones' stories have not yet made it to the annuals of herstory or history. Memory is a form of resistance. So collect and preserve the memories. Knowledge and intelligence is a form of resistance. Oppressive systems benefit from oppressed people not having knowledge and or being intelligent. Reiterating the last point, possessing the memory to have the knowledge of self and knowledge of people of origin is a form of resistance. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, his second wife, Amy Jakes Garvey, and Malcolm X taught knowledge of self. They maintain that knowledge of self cultivates pride and leadership. It equips one to determine their own destiny. They argue that African-Americans origin is in Africa and to take pride in the heritage and intellectualism that comes from Africa. Learn of the richness of the peoples of Africa, the origin of humanity, science, math, astrology, and healthcare. Know Mansa Musa, the gold king of West Africa, and Yah Asantewa, the Asante queen who led her troops against the British in 1900, and Menelik II, who ruled Ethiopia and defeated Italy at the Battle of Adwa when they tried to invade in 1896. Take pride in who you are and from where you come. Do not believe in the stereotypes that are placed on your race, ethnicity, gender, communities, or state. With knowledge of self, you can be great. John Henry Jackson is a prime example. He was born enslaved in Fayette County in 1850. However, his desire for an education led him to Berea College at age 16, directly after the Civil War. Not only was he the first African-American graduate from Berea College in 1874, he was the first African-American college graduate in the state of Kentucky. He was the first president of what is now known as Kentucky State University and the first permanent building on campus, Jackson Hall, 
is named in his honor. Despite being born enslaved, Jackson chartered his own destiny. He had knowledge of self and understood that he was not what his circumstances relegated him to. Another prime example is Dr. Carter G. Woodson. He was born in Virginia to enslaved parents, one generation removed from slavery. However, he did not allow the experiences of his parents to stop him. He did not allow poverty to stop him. He did not allow the stereotypes of being black stop him. Not only did he earn a literature degree from Berea College in 1903, right before the day law was implemented. He went on to earn a PhD from Harvard. The only other black man to do so prior to Dr. Woodson was Dr. W.B. Du Bois. However, Dr. Woodson did not relish in his accomplishments. As we know, in 1915, Dr. Woodson started what is now ASALA, which is still thriving today. It is the organization that sets the theme for Black History every month, for Black History Month every year, excuse me. This year's theme is the Black family, and the annual convention will be held virtually from September 13th through the 30th. He started Negro History Week in 1926 because the school systems were not teaching African and African American history. It has expanded formally to Black History Month, but his mission was for people to learn Black history all year and use February to celebrate all that they had learned. In the spirit of your alumni brothers, I charge you to be resistant by knowing thyself. Don't allow negativity to thwart your progress. Chart your own path, create your own destiny, and establish something meaningful and timeless. The second part of knowledge as it relates to facts, information, and skills acquired through experience and education is a point that I know I do not have to drive home to you amazing college students. I know that you are reading everything in your textbook and utilizing your, re your resources in your library. I know that you all are taking every opportunity possible to strengthen your writing skills. I know that this point does not apply to you, but I will share by saying, acquiring this type of knowledge is a form of resistance. Enslaved people were prohibited to learn to read and write. Some were beaten, some were stole, some were even lynched for yearning for knowledge. To have the ability to seek truth for themselves and not get the news from the owner's dinner table or wait for the news to come from the big house or the slave quarters, be rebellious, read, write, and learn. I charge you to start with Woodson's The Miseducation of a Negro, and then explore the autobiography of Malcolm X. Look at Left of Karl Marx by Dr. Carol Boyce Davies and Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Read the writings of Bell Hooks, a Kentuckian who also has ties to Berea College. Look at Toni Morrison, Audre Lorde, and Phyllis Wheatley. Listen to the poems of Gil Scott Heron and Amari Baraka. Watch the films of Spike Lee, Haley Garima, and Ava DuVernay. Explore the paintings of Kentuckian Alice Gatewood Waddell, a native of Bowling Green and an alumna of Western Kentucky University. And might I add, she was the first African-American Miss WKU. Explore Gordon Parks, Augusta Savage, and Jean Michael Basquiat. Acquire knowledge, learn as much as possible because it is a form of resistance. Organizing and mobilizing is also a form of resistance. Oppressive systems benefit from oppressed people being unorganized. History has shown us that those who organized made progress 
or were successful in their efforts. We can go back all the way to slavery to see Queen Nanny creating Nanny Town in the mountains of Jamaica and other Maroon leaders who organized free settlements during slavery. We can view Nat Turner organizing in Southampton County, Virginia, and also the most successful slave rebellion in the Western Hemisphere, the Haitian Revolution, and explore the organizational, the organizational skills of Bookman, Fatima, Jean-Jacques Dasselini's, Toussaint Leoverture, and the spiritual mothers. We can explore the mobilization of numerous ins enslaved people under Harriet Tubman, the great emancipator, and the many abolitionists and friends of friends known and unknown through the Underground Railroad. We can view the organization and mobilizational skills of activist Bishop Richard Allen, who created the African Methodist Episcopal denomination and church after he and Epsilon Jones were discriminated against as they were literally pulled off their knees at altar prayer at St. George's Methodist Church in Philadelphia. The AME Church, like others, charitably supports people with food, clothing, and shelter. Most importantly, they operate several historically black colleges and universities. One, not too far, is Wilberforce University in Wilberforce, Ohio, named after William Wilberforce, the abolitionist. Allen University in South Carolina is named after Bishop Richard Allen, Edward Waters College, located in Jackson, Florida, is the oldest HBCU in the state and the first AME school in the South, and it's named after the third AME Bishop. Morris Brown College, named after the fourth AME Bishop, is located in Atlanta, Georgia, and will return soon after 20 years of hardship. Other denominations and churches have been influential with organizing efforts to support African-Americans and movements. From annual scholarship awards given that are funded by bait sales, fish fries, and car washes, to teaching responsibility and leadership to the youth by way of the Young Deacon Board, Usher Board, and Sunday School, to serving as meeting places during the Civil Rights Movement, Churches are so influential that they too have been targets of terror from the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963 to the recent 2015 Charleston 9 shooting. Let's not forget about the numerous women who organized to make the modern civil rights movement successful. From history professor Joanne Robinson, to Fannie Lou Hamer, Coretta Scott King, Septima Clark, Daisy Bates, Ella Baker, Dorothy Height, and Diane Nash, just to name a few. Their endless efforts fostered policy change like the Civil Rights Act, Title IX, and the Voting Rights Act. Kwame Torre, or some may know him as Stokely Carmichael, Angela Davis, Kat Clathleen and Eldridge Cleaver, Bobby Seale, and Fred Hampton are a few who organized for the Black Power Movement. Many were members of the Black Panther Party. Several of their programs, like the Free Breakfast and Free Health Clinics, were co-opted into the federal government welfare program. Angela Davis is still fighting as a staunch advocate of prison reform. She supports the current defund the police movement as a former inmate who was acquitted. Today, people are organizing all over the world against injustices. They are planning marches, silent protests, forums, podcasts, blogs, vlogs, making music and writing poetry. Masses of people are resisting by organizing. The question is, Will you contribute? And if so, how? Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Anthony. That was an amazing presentation, especially during Black History Month. So on behalf of Berea College and the Black Cultural Center, we wanna say thank you. And this is the best part of the, of the evening because we wanna hear from our attendees. So if you have a question, please utilize the Q&A and we will be able to send those questions. I'll actually give those questions to Dr. Anthony. So if you wanna go ahead and start sending the questions to us and we'll take, we have plenty of time, I think for some questions. So I'll just go ahead and get us started, but please go ahead and utilize the Q&A option. All right, so the first question to get us started, Dr. Anthony, is what inspired you to start a career and passion in history, specifically with the diaspora? Right, wow. Um, I was inspired by my great grandparents. Um, I grew up with my, my great grandparents, uh, spent a lot of time in Camelsville, Kentucky, um, with, for those of you all who might be watching, who might uh, have heard of my great grandparents, R.K. Ivory and Miss Fanny Curry Ivory, um, but to, to listen to their stories. Um, and to hear about, of course, their time spent, they're both graduates of Kentucky State University, class of 36 and 39. Um, and I, I found it very interesting to know how they grew up and what, what they had to go through, um, particularly with my great grandmother um, as a black woman, you know, what was it like uh, growing up? And so when I got to school, uh, teach learning black history when I got to college um, I was like wow a lot of this stuff sounds like the things that my great grandparents were talking about and it drew me in and then of course um, one of my mentors both of my mentors who I mentioned with the libations uh, Dr. Sylvia Jacobs and Dr. Roslyn Turborg Penn um, have really influenced me when it comes to Africa and the diaspora they were amazing mentors and professors and they really drew you in to their stories that they were telling and so I wanted to learn more uh, and the more I learned in in class about the connections to Africa and African-American traditions um, really sparked my interest and then next thing I knew I had a PhD and now I'm teaching so <laughs> that's what inspired me first my great grandparents and then amazing professors uh, in, during my collegiate time. Thank you I think some of our students here at Berea College can definitely relate um, we had a couple of students that that was their question I jumped I, I beat them to it um, but they had that question about what inspired you or who inspired you to get involved with history. We have another question, a great one, actually two. So um, feel free and I can repeat that, repeat them as well. What movement do you think doesn't get enough attention as it should or a movement that is not taught as accurately as it should be? Mm. The first question, a movement that... Um is not as visible as it should be. I believe um, is of course, Marcus Garvey and the UNIA. Um, and not just Marcus Garvey, but the works of his second wife, Amy Jakes Garvey. Um, that is a movement that we tend to, of course, not learn it. I think that's the answer to both questions. We, we um, don't learn about it in the schools, we don't necessarily hear about Marcus Garvey and his far reaching uh, influence across the African diaspora and the various programs that he set up um, and, and learning about the women who were involved, uh, the, the, the movement back to Africa that he had um, with the, the Black Star Line, uh, I mean, there's so much with Marcus Garvey and, and it varies from city to city, continent to continent, country to country, you know? So, I mean, it's so rich in information. I think we really should look more at Marcus Garvey. Um, as far as a movement that we, uh, another one that we don't learn about, um, 
I think we're just really kind of getting into the Black Power movement. And we're really looking at, um, of course, the, the ideology of the members of the Black Power movement, as well as looking at the youth that were in there. We're, we really don't hear much about SNCC. We really don't hear much about Ella Baker, uh, one of the women who I mentioned, uh, who organized the youth, who they were really frustrated with the civil rights movement because progress was moving so slow. And um, the youth wanted things to happen quickly and they were, they were mentored by Ella Baker. And so she then took them to her alma mater, Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. And this is how SNCC is, is created and formed um, at, at Shaw University. And so we, we really don't hear a lot uh, about that. We, we're not taught a lot about how um, the youth are really pushing the envelope and Ella Baker uh, really um, organizing, as well as Brother Malcolm's uh, perspective on, on um, the Black Power movement, right? I think we get so caught up with his early preachings that we don't look at the evolved Malcolm after his uh, pilgrimage or his Hajj to Mecca when he returned. Um, and so we don't really explore him in, in his totality. Great, thank you. We have mm -hmm. another question. Um, what can I do on a local level to help contribute to the preservation of our history? Amazing question. Um, I think for one, and I know we say this all the time, but it definitely can start in the home. Um, if you, especially if I know with the pandemic going on, we do a lot of Zooming with our elders. Um, so definitely I wanna put out a preface to say, be, be careful and be cautious and, and the whole CDC guidelines, you know, don't overstep that. Um, but also make it make sure that you are interviewing or talking to it doesn't necessarily have to be a formal interview, but get some type of recording um, of your elders and the time that they uh, spent and their life growing up. What was it like for them to grow to grow up? Um, wherever they were, whether it was America uh, across the diaspora, um, what was it like? And then. Of course, it would be great uh, for our elders if we help them to organize. Uh, I'll say organize to, to um, be politically correct, but to clean out the basements and the garages and the attics and look and see what they have kept and why it was important to them. You know, why did you keep this newspaper clipping? Why did you keep uh, this? flyer or this pamphlet or whatever it may be that you might find and begin to organize those things. And you can donate them to an archive. Um, I don't want to speak for Berea College, but I'm sure the archivists would love, you know, that, that rich history. Um, we also would love it at Kentucky State as well. Uh, so like, yeah, collecting all of that memorabilia and then going out outside of the home, then going out into your communities, um, your church family, your mosque, uh, wherever you, you have fellowship, uh, sororities, fraternities, all of that, and interview those elders to get their perspective. And that's how we can start the local level. And then once we start putting those stories together, that then creates a state history. And then from that state history, we can then build to a regional history, whether it be the Southern region, this is what the South is doing, this is what the Midwest was doing, um, this is what the New England states were doing, right? And then those histories create a national history, and then that national history helps with an international history. So it starts in the home. We are the history makers. Great, thank you. We have another question from a student, and this student wants to know, if you're interested in history, what does it take to become an effective historian, especially if you want to use history to change the world? 
Awesome question. Awesome question. I know you all have amazing history professors at Berea College. So definitely schedule some office hours and um, learn of the curriculum that is there um, and start charting out your path for grad school. But definitely make sure that you're paying attention to everything. A great historian is a great researcher. Right. And so knowing how to ask those pivotal questions and being that why person, you know, why did this happen? Why was this effective? How did this impact? Why, why was this impactful? Right. And, and learning the whys um, and the hows and the how to's uh, and really becoming patient. You you definitely have to read a lot. You're definitely going to have to communicate with others and do interviews, um, become acquainted with your archives, right? Your archivist is your best friend. I kid you not, the archivist is your best friend because they're going to know where the primary resources are um, so that you can be effective and, and learn so that you can write um, and produce scholarship. Um, how do you become effective so that you can change the world? Do you the best way you know how? And I hope that makes sense, right? Um, there's no blueprint, if you will, but making sure that you're teaching the truth, making sure that you're writing, making sure that you're um, sharing information with neighboring institutions similar to what we're doing today. Um, you can create uh, so much on the digital platform, um, some type of blog, uh, a digital magazine, uh, anything. I mean, just put, put your information out there and someone will take hold to it. And if you change one person, you're changing the world. And when I say change one person, meaning enlightening them, with, with the history, um, teaching them something that they did not know. Uh, and, and so changing one person changes the world. Right, thank you, Dr. Anthony. Um, we have time, I have a couple more questions, but if our attendees, our participants um, would go ahead and put a couple more questions, we have time for a couple more um, before we wrap up. This question speaks to our current movements and trying to make the connection um, since it's about Sankofa and learning from our past. Um, what do you think our current, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement, what do you think our current movements could learn from our previous movements? There's like one piece of advice that you feel like those you know, seasoned revolutionaries would give to the current movement. What do you think that would be? Wow, you know, I honestly think that, you know, our Black Lives Matter movement is amazing and the, and, um, the work specifically that Tamika Mallory is doing. And when we look at like um, um, Benjamin Crump and, and the, the legal uh, force behind, you know, moving and then the way that people are able to organized and mobilized. Um, the one thing that I, I would say to go back and look is definitely making sure that all voices are heard. Um, and that was something that of course happened in, in the past, but the way that we study history, um, we always see the men in the forefront when it was the women who were in the back you know, doing the organizing it and working. So making sure that, you know, all lives are heard, making sure that everyone is included. I know that we oftentimes don't hear the name of Baynard Rustin because he was in a same-sex relationship. And it the, the idea of the image, you know, um, at that time, you know, was frowned upon. So he gets lost you know, in history, but he was very influential with organizing the March on Washington. So let's make sure that everyone, you know, gets, gets a, a seat at the table and their voices are heard so that they are preserved in history 50 years from now, 
you know, when we're talking about this moment, the same way we talk about the modern civil rights movement. Um, and to make sure that we are like remaining patient, but at the same time, pushing the envelope forward, finding that balance, you know? Um, and yeah, definitely we have so many um, resources today with the internet and getting the word out quickly and throughout the world um, to, to make sure that you're utilizing your resources to the best of your ability. Those are some of the things I think, but I think that they're so on point, you know, um, that, yeah, yeah. It, right. Thank you, thank you. And, and we've spent, you know, tonight talking about a lot of great leaders from the past all the way into our current leaders like Tamika Mallory. Um, but I think it's also important to celebrate um, some of our leaders in academia and the work, the research that is being done. So you may not be on the front lines, but you know we, we have different roles in the movement. And so Absolutely. we need our intellectuals, we need academia. And so if you could um, just share with us your research interests. I know that you have authored your book, you have a spoken word album as well. Could you tell, I know our students and our faculty and staff would love to know um, what research you're working on and, and tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, my book, that it was published in 2009 um, and the title is the Universal Ethiopian Students Association uh, Mobilizing the Diaspora. And what it does is it looks at an organization um, of Garveyites. So it is an extension of Marcus Garvey's UNIA. Marcus Garvey was deported in 1926 for mail fraud. And the Central Division of the UNIA, which is located in the Philadelphia, New York area, New Jersey, um, they were having some internal issues because Garvey is not there. Garvey's headquarters was in Harlem. And so without Garvey's presence, there were there was some, some internal issues. And so some of those members broke off and started the Universal Ethiopian Students Association. And at that time in 1927, when they started, the term Ethiopia was a universal term to mean black. Um, they were uh, coming off of the heels of um, Ethiopianism, which is a movement that occurred, I mentioned um, Menelik II, and once he was able to defeat Italy at the Battle of Adwa, there was this great movement across the diaspora um, to celebrate Ethiopia and to recognize um, themselves as Ethiopian. And so this is where that term comes from. And so they were able to organize and they got the blessing from Marcus Garvey to start the organization. And they really continued on with the mission of the UNIA just under a different name. Um, his second wife, Amy Jakes Garvey, worked closely with the um, UESA uh, and they started a journal, it's called The African, and she becomes uh, a contributor writing articles, and then she then becomes one of the editors and the main editor of that journal, uh, which is she has those skills. She was the editor of The Negro World and The Black Man, uh, the newspapers that the UNIA published. And so you're seeing um, this group uh, in Harlem, uh, located in Harlem, but with members across the African diaspora coming together to help fight against injustice, to help enlighten the diaspora with what's going on with their newspaper. They then in 1935 um, are able to help Emperor Haile Selassie uh, when Italy comes back to, to invade or to try to invade. Um, he, they then contribute $5,000 in the height of the depression in 1935 to Emperor Haile Selassie. And he's able to take those funds and build up his uh, healthcare system. They, they build um, a hospital. He gets ambulances. He's able to build uh, schools. He's able to start his aviation program. 
And so the UESA was very, very influential um, during that time. And I, I write about them from 1927 to 1948. And um, so, yeah, that's, that is my, my first book that, that is out. And so we're still kind of digging up research to continue uh, looking at, at that, that history, but definitely looking at Marcus Garvey and Amy Jakes Garvey. All right, thank you. We have another question from our audience tonight. What suggestions do you have to help us protect ourselves against metadata, capitalism, and racism, considering that a lot of us are using the internet to organize and share ideas? Great question. Absolutely, that is a great question. And I'm not quite sure if I know um, the answer, to be honest. Um, I think definitely you have to tap into your intuition when it comes to things like that. I'm not the most technology savvy person to, to help on that end, but definitely use your intuition to know if um, it doesn't feel right to post something or to comment to something, uh, then don't, you know? And then as well, know that there are a lot of bots out there and uh, don't get sucked into the negativity. That's, that's their purpose. Their purpose is to, you know, get you to write something that could, later become disparaging um, to get you to, to as, as the elders say, get your blood pressure high, you know, and ruin your day so that you can't be productive moving forward. So pay attention to those types of things and, and don't let those trigger you. Um, and as, as far as protecting yourself, I think the best um, protection outside of you know, the physical making sure that when you're at a protest or at a rally, that as the as the elders say, you keep your head on a swivel and you're paying attention, knowing where the exits are, knowing where um, things are blocked off. Um, but definitely make sure, um, especially we've seen the, uh, especially last summer, uh, we saw the tear gas all the time, making sure that you're equipped, take some milk with you. Um, if you're a tear gas so that you can quickly um, come back to making sure that you have water with you to stay hydrated, making sure that your cell phone is charged just in case um, you have to get away from your group. Um, go, go as a group. Don't do anything um, individual or isolated just in case someone has to contact your parents or, or a caregiver um, to let you know. And then let people know what you're doing, right? Let people know and um, definitely connect with organizations so that if you are in an instance where, especially if you're purposefully wanting to be arrested to, to um make a stance like they did in the modern civil rights movement and they filled the jails, you know? If that is the objective, making sure that you're connecting to the organization so that they have the bail money and they know the proper protocol for um, bailing people out of jail and so that this is a smooth transition because the idea is to make a point, right? And, and to draw attention uh, to, to the issues that are being um, fought for, right? And so I would, I would say that. And then of course, reading everything possible. Read about the movements, read about the civil rights movement, read about um, Marcus Garvey and the UNIA, read about the early civil rights movement that occurred directly after slavery and what we call the reconstruction era and all of that, you know, learn about the black power movement and the black Panther party um, so that you can have some idea because um, the surveillance has always been there and the surveillance will always be there, you know? So understanding those tactics will help you to move forward in present day. And I hope I answered that question. I think you did. And I think you touched on other issues because my, my question, my follow-up to that would have been, 
what advice would you give to current students who are activists? You know, this is a college where we have faculty and staff linked. They'll be linking up with students. I mean, these are COVID times, so we can't physically link up, but we're there protesting with our students. We're there being supportive of our students. But we do know that sometimes it can be very, there can be a lot of tension, right, when we're out. And so I think you, you spoke to that about advice for students who want to be involved in activism, but the organization part and the preparation, you know, is, is very key. Is there any other advice that you would give to a, a student activist that especially from, you know, the collegiate perspective? Absolutely. Um... Definitely understand that this is a movement and not a moment. So don't be in such a, a rush to complete everything, right? Things take time. Um, and I'm not saying be lackadaisical by no means, but definitely understand that Things do take time and everything's not going to happen overnight. And I think that's, it's not necessarily, um, I think that's a difference between the past and, and what we're dealing with. I think we are, because of modernity, are in such a microwave type of society, if you will, and we want things to happen immediately. Um, and there are some things that don't happen that way. And we have to be patient, but at the same time, still push the envelope, right? I would definitely say um, if, and this is outside of COVID, of course, but if there are demonstrations to be had, definitely bring in people who can train and educate those who want to participate in the proper way to um, mobilize and demonstrate. Like you said, the linking arm in arm together, um, organizing to make sure that maybe everyone, especially if it's a, a demonstration that's going to take place off campus, um, everyone might wear the same color shirt so everyone can be you know, accounted for and identified. Um, making sure that some type of phone tree and some type of check-in person um, is there. Uh, and it definitely, like, that's where the organizing really comes from. And um, making sure that everyone is accounted for, having extra, like I said, the extra milk, just in case the tear gas comes, uh, extra water so people can stay hydrated, um, making sure people have... Um, safety kits, like the first day, just in case anything happens. We don't ever want that to happen, but you always want to plan for the worst um, and then hope for the best. So making sure that there's um, peroxide or alcohol or something, if someone scrapes the knee or something, you know, something like that. But definitely bringing in people who um, know how to demonstrate to show the proper way to link up, the, the proper way to put the women in the middle uh, to allow the men on the outside for extra protection. Those types of things, um, I think that for one, our activist leaders have to learn from themselves and then be the conduits to train those who are interested. Thank you. Thank you so much. The great advice to our students. I know that they heard you. Um, this was a powerful presentation on behalf of the Black Cultural Center. We want to say thank you for participating in Black History Month, of course, but also we want to thank um, you for, for being the guest speaker for this convocation. And with that, I also want to thank Tomas for getting all of this together and ISNS for making this happen. Uh, people will be able to view this later. It is being recorded. Uh, so I'll let Tomas give the closing remarks, but thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, I'm so happy that you all could join us tonight. And uh, uh, I want to, again, uh, say thank you so much, Dr. Anthony, for that presentation, for all the um, comments and, and answering the questions. Of course, to my dear colleague, Christina, the director of the Black Cultural Center for serving as moderator. and. Not to forget uh, our AV engineer, Kyle Wooten, behind the scenes. Um, kudos to you for the technical support. 
Um, next week, uh, please join us for the Robbins Peace Lecture with Father Greg Boyle, who will talk about his work with marginalized populations in Los Angeles. So that's next week, same time, same place. And again, as Christina mentioned, we'll post the video on the uh, Convocations homepage, and that will happen most likely uh, on Monday. Okay, we hope to see you next week. Um, stay safe, everyone. Trade carefully and uh, good night. Bye-bye.